a lot of wine, so I guess I'm testing that. All right, good for you. And and how are things? How are things? Are you in Ireland today, or how are things where you're at? Yeah, I came out of Denver on Saturday, the 14th of March, or whatever it was, and uh, I got out a couple of days early, so I got home fine. So I've been here since, but to be honest, I'm kind of working seven days a week and I have my office out in the backyard. And, you know, every couple of days I go down to the store and I get the stuff and it's, it's fine, really. Ireland was pretty good with this whole thing. A few weeks ago, they, they had a good social distancing. The stores had got um, marks on the ground, queues outside. They managed six people in, six people out. You know, they had masks. They had hand washing. And then a couple of days ago, they tightened up and put a two kilometer radius, unless you have really travel you need to do. And if you don't have a job that's really important or critical, a couple of days ago, they kind of tightened further. But they've played a good game so far. And the, the median age of infection in Ireland is 46. And the median age of death is around 80 or more. Yeah. And we got a lot of nursing home clusters. So all in all, it's, it seems to be running re- pretty well. Yeah, I mean, just like most diseases we know, and this is, a, this is a, you know, obviously a wake-up call to, to uh, hopefully sort of decrease the burden of disease because that is obviously when we have these extra stress on the healthcare system, the pandemics, it really just uh, shows where we, where we really let people down. Right, I'm gonna, so the way this works, everybody's muted. They're going to be able to ask questions through the chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna be greedy and ask at a time because just because it's my prerogative I suppose and then once we do that um, I'll open it up to questions if you're if you're amenable to that is that okay? Yeah, that's cool. You're glitching occasionally, but it's workable at the moment. Okay. Ask. Um, can we definitively say at this point that coronary artery calcification is reversible? Hmm. Okay. So I'd say there are anecdotal reports from all over the world. Now that people are starting to use it where they've got reversals uh, often on the same machine. So in principle, yes. And William Davis, MD cardiologist did a human study in 2009 and published, and he got 44 patients. And after three years of low carb magnesium, fish oil, blah, 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 a multi-factor intervention, he got around half to regress, around half uh, progressed at not too fast a rate compared to normal, and three of them out of the 44 progressed rapidly. So again, he established on a full cohort of 45, published that he had quite a bit of regression. Now, My cut on it is, I think I'd agree with Arthur Agatston, who developed the scoring algorithm for the calcium scan 30 years ago, uh, that younger, fresher plaque that are growing in the last few months with spotty calcification, I think you'll certainly see regression of that and regression of plaque when you do the right multi-factor intervention. What's more controversial is older, dense plaque that are full of calcium kind of dormant to what extent that the calcium will leach back out slowly as you fix the root causes that's kind of more a question but i think we have a new movie coming out it's actually releasing i think tomorrow (laughs) so uh, you'll be able to get it for a really low cost and it follows 45 irish sports people from the 1991 mega final and they're in their 50s now we scanned them all we saw shocking amounts of disease in some of them Uh, One of them went on to have a multiple bypass and all 45 were presumed to be healthy. We scanned them. Nine of them were super high risk. So that'll give people an idea of the power of the scan. But the movie follows one particular hero who took all the actions that we would say are really good for addressing a high score. And you'll see that he was very successful too, you know, so... It's going to emerge in the next few years as calcium scanning is used widely. A few things are going to happen. One, what we just discussed, is going to become more common knowledge. Cardiologists are going to become informed. Uh, The cholesterol hypothesis is going to get an absolute hammering because we know from 20 calcification studies that 
LDL and cholesterol barely correlate with the degree of arterial disease as properly measured. And uh, we're going to see more around what diets and interventions, multi-factor, are really effective in actually slowing, stopping, maybe even reversing cardiac disease. So I think the age of calcium scanning is upon us, and it behooves us all to help uh, accelerate the use of this amazing test to fix all those things I mentioned. Yeah, Ivor, when you said multifactorial uh, interventions, what seems to be the things that, that uh, potentially work? Well, just eating meat. It's a single factor, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. So multifactor, I'll do, I'll do a list of what the best of the science and data would suggest are the biggies uh, in approximate order. So anything you do to reduce insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, blood glucose spikes after a meal, all of that whole hyperinsulinemia, type 2 diabetes axis, anything you do to reju reduce, mitigate, or abatement in that is going to be huge. So that's the big thing. And there's lots of ways to do it, but, but that's a big thing. Then I would say that magnesium is pretty enormous in my mind. A recent study looked at calcification rates of progression over a couple of years in kidney patients. It was a randomized control trial with humans, published peer-reviewed. And they saw in the placebo group a progression of 41% per annum, which is very dangerous if you're above 15% per annum. And in the group with magnesium hydroxide, single intervention, magnesium only, they saw 11%, which is actually below the magic safe 15% level. And that was just magnesium. That was just magnesium. So you can see the enormous impact that certain things can have. Potassium, I would say also, uh, UV and sun exposure or the use of lamps if you don't get much sun, like Ireland, for nitric oxide, for vitamin D, for many other photo products. Very healthy, good for the arteries. Um, fasting, I would say, is an excellent addition to the multi-factor for many reasons. And uh, fish oil, EPA, DHA. So fish oil got kind of some bad press in the last few years where they did studies on humans, but these people already had a pretty okay omega-3 index and they gave them very small amounts, like maybe 800 milligrams of fish oil. And they saw some signal with reduced heart disease, but it wasn't that strong. So they kind of dismissed fish oil. But guess what? There's a new RCT out, but they've got a patented fish oil. And I have it on good authority that it's no different functionally from a good EPA DHA. It's just got a slight tweak to the manufacturing process to make it patented. And they've declared a stunning success with 30% reduction in cardiac event rates, as good as a statin for a fish oil, but they used two uh, grams, or I could be wrong, it could have been three point something grams. So they got people who are probably deficient and they gave them a really big dose. Uh, so I suspect that when something is patented and has profit potential, that's when you'll get to see the really good trials, right? High doses, right type of people. So I've listed out a few there. They're probably the primary ones. Vitamin K2, MK7 at 350 micrograms a day would be very suggestive to be beneficial, but we don't really have as much proof yet. So I'd say K2, MK7. Um, and yeah, that's probably the top stack of the things you do all together. And resistance training, of course, and elimination of foods that cause any autoimmune reaction or, or immune reaction or leaky gut. So that's quite a basket of things, many plant foods that cause issues depending on someone's genotype. So that's something you wanna watch for too, because if you fix the other list I mentioned, but you've got an autoimmune type problem and you don't mitigate it, you could still end up with quite a bit of arterial action going on. Hey, Ivor, you said, you know, we're looking at maybe really, uh, you know, putting some uh, 
you know, knocking down this uh, diet heart hypothesis with the cholesterol a little bit. Can we say at this um, uh, that well is universally personally good or it is very much context dependent? Where, where are we at in that sort of can uh, that still will say that you know LDL is just useful is to reduce it as much as possible in, in pretty much every situation. What, what are your thoughts on where we are? Right. Yeah. You broke up a little, but I think I got the gist of it. Yeah. LDL, where does it really stand? So I'd say I'll try and keep this brief. So LDL particles are physiologic, they're innate, they're evolutionary. They themselves inherently do not drive heart disease. However, if you damage your LDL particles, by desialization or oxidation or other ways that they are modified, they can become part of the problem. So I'd say think of not so much that LDL is a problem, but compromised LDL may be a problem. So one of the main reasons that LDL correlates with heart disease is because it correlates with problems that really drive heart disease. So for instance, there is nothing in this universe that will drive up your LDL particle count like hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome will. So of course it's going to have a big correlation with heart disease because it's a proxy for hyperinsulinemia, right? So LDL particle counts particularly or small dense LDL are an excellent reflection of metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance syndrome. So they're going to correlate a lot, but the extent to which they're actually causal you can look at it this way. If you put a man 50 years old in the five world's risk algorithms, a higher LDL total cholesterol will show a higher risk. But if you set the type 2 diabetes, the hypertension, and the ratios of total to HDL to be a very non-insulin resistant person, then the cholesterol no longer predicts high risk. Even in a man of 50, who has an LDL of 190 milligrams and a total of 320 milligrams. That person is low risk once you put the figures in the algorithm to say that they're not insulin resistant. And we have a host of papers and studies saying the same thing. If your transferrin saturation is good, LDL shows no predictive power, you know? Uh, if you have got low hypertension, no hypertension. In another study, LDL has no predictive power for carotid progression, right? So again and again, ferritin. If you're low ferritin, LDL no longer predicts. So we've got every single time that you control for a real factor or a real problem and you control for that, LDL falls off the map. So LDL is more a proxy for underlying metabolic uh, issues. Uh, but of course, because it's the only thing there's a drug for, and there's no drug for any of the other stuff I mentioned, of course, it'll be the primary focus. And the last thing I'd say on that is, in defense of the people who are obsessed with LDL, God knows I, I argue with a lot of them, in their defense, the drugs that lower LDL, lower damaged particles, lower compromised particles, they do mitigate somewhat the heart disease problem. It's not impressive. Uh, I would say you get way bigger bang for the book by tackling the list we talked about a few minutes ago. I mean, no brainer. But the drugs that lower the LDL do mitigate the problem, and that's all they've got to give you. So, of course, if that's all they've got, and if it does mitigate the problem somewhat, then, then that's all they're going to talk about. So that's kind of the way I view the drugs. And if you're not going to take action to fix the root causes, to be honest, why not take the drug if you're not going to tackle what's driving the disease instead? You know, it'll give you some benefit. Uh, but that has to be balanced, of course, against side effects and other issues. But, you know, go for it. I'm seeing, you know, particularly with the development of these PCA, where we have the capacity to, to bring LEL down 50, 40, 30, 20, um, 
advocated for secondary prevention in some cases in these quote unquote statin resistant patients. Uh, I just wonder what that's going to result in if there's going to be indirect harm associated with that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's early days for that. But I mean, the big trials that had the PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, the biggest one showed a reduction in cardiac events of around 20 odd percent for a 50 plus percent reduction in APOB LDLP. Uh, not that impressive, to be honest. It also showed no reduction in all cause mortality, right? In fact, there was slightly higher all cause mortality on the drug, but it wasn't statistically significant. But I mean, it even went the wrong direction. And there was also no reduction in cardiovascular death or mortality. Now, the defenders of the drug will say, oh, it was a short trial. But I mean, it shouldn't have been a short trial if that's the case. They should have done a proper trial. But anyway, um, it just wasn't impressive for the massive reduction in LDL. And as I acknowledged a short while ago, if you greatly reduce the particle number, you're going to reduce the burden on the system. It doesn't mean that LDL particles are a root cause. It just means you're mitigating. And with those huge reductions, to get a reduction in kind of composite endpoints of hospitalization or requirement for um, PCI or you know, it's just not impressive to me at all. And it doesn't surprise me and it doesn't impress me. So that's all they've got. It's their new shiny toy. And it can be applied to people who have serious problems with statins. So I kind of say, well, fine. In terms of negative effects, we, we just don't know, really, because the trials were very short. And there's a question mark as well for inclusion to the trial. I'm not sure if they had washout periods where they removed people in advance who had a bad reaction. I'm not sure the data on that, though it happened with a lot of statin trials. So I think it'll be unclear potential long-term effects uh, for quite a while yet. There's a new one as well in Clearazan. Um, and I think there's a new LP little a reducing drug so they also may show a reduction in events and they could become blockbusters. But I think the same thing applies as I already said. You're mitigating because you don't have the knowledge or the wherewithal or, or I don't know, the je ne sais quoi to actually tell people about the root causes, the multi-factor intervention that will cause an enormous difference in your risk. If you're not going to focus on any of that really crucial stuff, what you're left with is, yeah, some drugs, I guess. All right, Ira, here's, a, here's some questions, uh, and that's asking about calcium supplementation. Uh, or, you know, if you take calcium supplements, and if, is there other supplements you should take to prevent, I guess, calcifying in your arteries? And is there any concern with that? Yeah, the, well, calcium supplements have a bit of a bad name. And to be honest, my default will be to get calcium from healthy uh, foods, whole foods, and make sure you're targeting nutrient-dense foods. And that kind of covers the calcium. The calcium supplements, when they're given in that form, there were RCTs and trials where they thought calcium would help, and it kind of backfired and caused more heart disease. So it's not so much that uh, dietary calcium will affect calcification directly, but too much dietary calcium will disturb the calcium-magnesium balance and lead to physiological problems that could encourage the disease of atherosclerosis. So I just, I think if you're going to take supplements, I would focus more on magnesium, potassium, K2, MK7, you know, possibly iodine can be a problem with people being deficient and uh, chromium for people with diabetes or diabetic type dysfunction, chromium may, a deficiency may be a problem. So there are just a few, but I, I wouldn't really be supplementing with calcium. I'd be focusing on nutrient dense foods that bring in natural calcium at the appropriate level. I don't know if that kind of answers. Yeah, no, I think it does, Ivor. Um, what, I know you spoke about the, the benefits of this sort of as being beneficial, but what about just eating fatty fish? Is that, a, is that an appropriate uh, proxy for that? I, I think it's an amazing proxy, to be honest, because the fatty fish, 
there are some studies that suggest they bring in not just the EPA DHA, which they do, but they also bring it in in slightly different forms and with other things that may be beneficial. So if you get kind of smaller fish that don't have any mercury issues, or I must say cod liver oil is another thing that's very inexpensive and, and purified and mercury free now, they remove all mercury because you know the fish do have a problem with mercury buildup. Um, so certainly the fish, one can I noticed yesterday in this lockdown, uh, I'm eating a can each day. I fell out of the habit a long time ago. I'm back to it of uh, tin sardines, tinned red salmon. So it's wild caught. And they got around two grams of what we're talking about. And you're eating real nutrient dense food with loads of other benefits included. So I'd say, yeah, if, you know, tin fish, small fish, um, or larger fish that are wild caught and maybe not so much of a mercury problem, that's all really healthy stuff. And cod liver oil or supplements if you don't really like the fish thing. Um, Terry, and this is back. Terry's asking if, if the West can learn from some Asian countries like ta Taiwan about dealing with pandemics, public policy that might need to change to, to prevent. Uh, oh, boy, boy, could they happen. learn? Oh, yeah. Sorry, you're breaking up a bit. I'm not sure if I'm interrupting you there, but Taiwan and other uh, countries in Asia. Yeah, I released a video the other day and I just did a podcast la an hour ago with Dave Fellman and we're going to tag on some of this footage to the back of the podcast. Taiwan have got 30 million people. Italy have 60 million. Italy have 120,000 infections and 12,000 deaths. Taiwan, who are right beside China, right in the epicenter, have got around 400 infections and around five or six deaths. The numbers speak. But what did Taiwan do? Back in January, when this thing popped up, they immediately started getting masks to everyone in the population. And I mean immediately. Within a week or so, they actually, I know this isn't very American, but they took over the companies that were making masks and they took over direct control. And they set up a system where all outlets, 24-hour stores could supply masks. And people who tried to get more than that they were entitled to, the system would say, no, you're not getting more. They also had a delivery system to people who couldn't make it to the store to get the masks. So anyway, do I need to say masks again? I don't think so. So that's huge. They had infrared measurement at all the schools. And they only shut the schools for two weeks, even though they were in the epicenter. And then they open them again. But they have infrared measuring devices, which are cheap as chips. And they have them at all the school entrances, all the businesses, all the stores. Everyone coming in gets a zap to their forehead. And if you got a temperature, you immediately tell the authorities and you self-isolate. If a teacher gets a temperature, they get that person out of there and they shut that class down in the short term. And if more than two students turn up with a temperature inside, they shut the class and maybe the school. So it's all engineering approach. They are tracking and they are zoning in on where it matters. Isolating their older, sicker people, of course, because they're the ones that are going to hit the hospitals. And then they have something that's more controversial that you guys won't like and I'm uncomfortable with. But they have phone apps that pretty much track everyone. And you notify if you have a fever or any symptoms you self-isolate, but they also can come after you. If your phone even goes off for an hour, someone's going to contact you and ask you why your phone's off. So they're tracking of everyone in order to isolate people and find out who they were with and where they traveled to, to investigate a breakout. That's pretty invasive. So that one is, yeah, that's tricky. But look what they achieved. It's stunning. Absolutely stunning, in fairness. Yeah, that's a, it's kind of a, a kind of potentially slippery slope, kind of an interesting where, where people are going to sort of be comfortable and draw the line. Um, this is a question about um, the MTA and homocysteine levels regarding re relating to heart. Um, do you think that if, if someone has folate or is, are the links between homocysteine and heart disease uh, somewhat overblown? 
Yeah, again, a little break there, but uh, homocysteine and folate and all, it's one I haven't spent too much time on, and there's a bit of controversy around it. How much is homocysteine a flag for a metabolic challenge or a, a shortage of folate, et cetera, and B vitamins? And how much is homocysteine the, the uh, biochemically a driver? And to be honest, uh, when I spent a little time on this, you know, it was hard to get clarity on that. So the way I view it is consider homocysteine a marker of uh, insufficiency in B vitamins and folate, et cetera, and get a nutrient-dense diet to run after that. Absolutely. Uh, but is homocysteine being higher directly damaging the arteries through the mechanisms that are put forward? I'm not so sure on that one. So again, yeah, I wouldn't go too deep into that, but it appears to be a good marker to react to. Okay. There is a relationship between LDL and subfractions in the immune system. Oh, LDL and the immune system. Now, Dave Feldman and Siobhan, uh, his sidekick, have done some great work on this. And I think they have recently a new blog post on cholesterolcode.com. So that's a great one to look at. I have a few papers, didn't delve too much, but certainly LDL seems to be important in the innate immune system, the first line of defense. So LDL can bind to pathogens and then flag itself and get cleared up. Some people would suggest that LDL, that's a really big role for it, and that the LDL getting cleared then through the arterial system is part of the reason that LDL gets framed for atherosclerosis is if you have a high burden of infection and LDL is engaged, that compromised LDL that has been involved in the process of binding to pathogens then becomes kind of entrained into the atherosclerotic process, giving it a bad name. So I wouldn't get into so much detail on that, but there are many papers and lines of inquiry and suggestive data and mechanisms and actual data that say that yes, LDL is very much part of the immune system. And LDL can also, through my friend Gabor Erdosi sent me papers, the Hungarian biologist, and it shows evidence that LDL can sometimes supply energy for the immune system when it is in turn fighting infections like macrophage. So LDL can be recruited to actually supply lipid energy and other components to aid the immune system. So I think it's a really interesting field and it probably goes towards explaining why higher LDL people, especially as they're older, uh, have less problems with relate to uh, illness from you know, um, respiratory problems. And, and generally that higher LDL is healthier when you're older is two things. One through its connection to the immune system and two, in fairness, there's a little reverse causality that, you know, if you're healthier, you'll tend not to have a lower LDL. And if you are unhealthy in late stage or with an inflammatory condition, it can tend to drive down LDL. So there's a little bit of reverse causality there, but I'd say there's also a big chunk of healthiness with higher LDL to help protect you from some diseases of aging. And again, this goes to what I talked about. I wonder if about an LDL uh, being below 60 or 50 is being in the heart attack proof zone. When you're sitting there with that low level of LDL and you get an infection, I mean, do we, do we run out of LDL or what happens when, when, we're, when we have a, you know, a shock to the system of cancer or something that requires significant immune uh, response? I'm just you know, curious about that. So that's, uh, I think what I got there was, so LDL lowering when you have a problem. Yeah, it appears the lipoprotein system is very connected to immune system. And when you have a major issue, the counts can drop quite a lot. And HDL as well, because HDL is also very much connected to immune system. So it can drop also. So HDL, LDL dropping are a flag for that kind of problem. Now, heart attack proof, you also mentioned, uh, we have people who have really low LDL with enormous atherosclerosis. 
there's one person actually who has a condition where his HDL is not so functional and the LDL was only in the 40s and like there was enormous multivessel disease. And the weird thing was when they put him on PCSK9 from memory, his LDL actually went up a bit, <laughs> almost like his body was gasping. Um, so yeah, there are many cases of lower LDL with enormous atherosclerosis. It's true on average, lower LDL, probably because having a low LDL particle count does interfere with the atherosclerotic process, maybe mitigates or reduces it. You know, very low LDL tends to have less heart disease, but trying to say that that proves LDL is a problem. Well, I'd say, what about the guy we have with an LDL over 700, right? Lifetime, who has zero calcium score and clean arteries in his 70s or late 60s. We have a family of familial hypercholesterolemics in the UK. Dr. Malhotra brought this up. In their 60s, two sisters and a brother, LDL up at a level of American units, LDLs around 400 plus, 500 maybe, long term, zero calcium scores, clean angiogram in one of them, right? In their 60s. So this LDL thing, I mean, this, this has become a farce. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's just a farce. Somebody mentioned, you know, because you've mentioned mercury and fish. Um, is there any role that selenium might have in mitigating that, I suppose? I guess that's the nature of the question there. Do you know anything about that, Ivor? Not a whole lot. I know that selenium is important in immune system function. So it's probably one of the things that these current times you shouldn't be deficient in. But you only need a few Brazil nuts, I think, to get a decent amount each day. So that's a really easy way to get it. Uh, in terms of counteracting the toxicity from mercury, it rings a bell. But to be honest, avoiding the mercury in the first place is probably the main thing. Some people genetically clear heavy metals like lead and mercury very well. And we're seeing recently that some people are genetically very poorly capable of clearing these metals and they need to be really careful. Possibly APOE4 people are one example of that. So I think avoiding getting the toxicity in the first place is probably the best strategy. And when you have it, I know that uh, collation has got a dirty name because a lot of people were cl claiming it as magic for many things. But I believe that the proper type of collation can be very effective if done uh, with medical supervision to actually leach these uh, heavy metals out of your body. The challenge is that the heavy metals tend to sequester in bone. They can also go to brain. And because we were never exposed to them during our whole evolutionary development, our bodies are less than amazing at clearing them. You know, because until mining and modern technology came along, the chances of, you know, ancestral humans or anyone getting within a mile of elemental mercury or lead was basically zero. There was a, I'm just trying to think what you, you put up there. Oh yeah, APOE4. So uh, a lot of people say if you've got that genetic marker, uh, then you need to avoid saturated fat. What are your thoughts on that sentiment? Oh. Okay, this is, a, this is a contentious one. So I interviewed Dr. Stephen Gundry, who's a big proponent of that theory. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I released the podcast. So you can maybe link it afterwards. And um, we had the discussion and we differ on it. I proposed to him that the black swans are too massive to fully accept that. So for instance, the Maasai had a meat and high saturated fat and milk and dairy diet and they had incredibly low heart disease or any diseases of modernity. And likewise, we have other populations. So there's so many black swans that say that meat and saturated fat cannot be a problem, that how could you really accept it? And he accepted those points. He also accepted that he sees saturated fat and cheese as a problem for APOE4s who have heart disease or prior metabolic damage but he never fully separated the cheese from the saturated fat or meat per se. So he pretty much acknowledged that it could very much be the cheese and possibly even through the modern cheeses with their A1 type case or proteins, 
they may cause immune reaction in many people. And that could be the deleterious effect. So I think it could be cheese. That's something to be careful of more than the saturated fat. But I'll say one last thing. Uh, the exception proves the rule. So I think humans, whether AP, APOE4 or otherwise, if they were never damaged by modern processed and ultra processed foods and all the things we know cause heart disease and metabolic damage, if those humans were never damaged by the modern stuff, I don't think you'd find anyone with a problem. But I think it's possible that people who have sustained metabolic damage, diabetic dysfunction, may now be a little sensitive, some of them, towards rich saturated fats or cheeses. So I think it's ironic that we, we find, even though we've realized that saturated fat is not a problem, and all of that key stuff was absolute horseshit, even though we know that now, we still find something we can blame on saturated fat. But the irony is, the likelihood is, the only reason saturated fat might be a problem is because of what the ultra processed food has done to these people's metabolisms. So even if we can pin something on saturated fat now, the reason for the problem is still, you know, not the fat. It's, it's what was done to these people over the last 50 or 60 years. Hey, Ivor, um, one of the things that uh, many people don't realize because we all, you know, meat is bad because it's got saturated fat, but it has quite a bit of monounsaturated fat. In fact, beef, you know, if you look at the profile, it's actually got more monounsaturated fat than saturated fat. Is monounsaturated fat, is there some, is there good evidence to show that? Or is saturated fat neutral? Or how do we, can we say that, you know, because you beef has lots of monounsaturated fat before us. What do you, what's your take on mono versus saturated fat? Yeah, that's uh, hmm. I was just talking to uh, Asim Alhotra, the cardio from England. Uh, many people would be familiar about, on that very topic. And what we agreed in the end was mono seems to have a very bland, benign profile in terms of metabolic response or effects. So people who have metabolic damage, who have very high heart disease, probably it's wise to watch out for their markers going the wrong way when they eat too much saturated fat, potentially, especially oils and uh, solid fats and, and, and very high fat content. That, that behooves them because they've got big disease, big risk, so they need to look carefully. But a metabolically healthy person, I don't think you're going to see anything really sat versus mono. So when we make fat in our body, we make it monounsaturated and saturated. Okay. That's what our fat is made up of, saturated and mono. And, you know, calling mono better, it may be metabolically better for metabolically damaged people who have developed sensitivities. I suspect that is the case at most. But another important thing is most of the data implicating saturated fat was gained by having high carb diets along with the fat. So I think Professor Volokh and Krauss and some of his human RCTs, the saturated fat in the context of a low carb diet or very low carb doesn't look at all negative in most of the science. But the the studies you see that finger or blame the saturated fat, they always have 40% carbohydrate and sugars in there as well. So I think there's a lot of deception in science uh, and really a lot of really bad science where they jack people up on a high carb, high fat diet. And then of course, turn them around and blame the fat. So there's a mountain of that, particularly rodent studies, but also human studies. So look, if you've got heart disease, you're a high risk person, you want to play it really safe, watch your blood markers and see, do you get a negative response of sorts if you take a lot of saturated fat and then maybe tilt towards mono, you know, or more fish, more avocado, you know, more olive rather than, I don't know, the really meaty stuff, maybe. But there's something else about that. You mentioned it actually, Sean. Zoe Harcomb did an analysis, I think of a ribeye, or a strip loin. And when you look at the absolute amount of saturated fat in it, it's not even that high for an average steak. And you're right, it's half mono, half saturated. 
So even if saturated was a problem in very high quantities, a steak ain't the way to get that problem anyway, really. So anyway, that was just the last point. I think you'd get more from coconut oil, palm oil, and I mean, if, yeah. you're, if you're really worried about concentrated fats, or beef is not the best source of that. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, other risk uh, markers. Uh, I know you're obviously a huge priority calcium scan. Are there other things out you become a fan of? Is visceral fat? Because uh, obviously you can ultrasound it. It's maybe harder to assess. It's not a blood test, which is so convenient, but are there any hang your hat on blood tests out there and any other tests outside of CAC that you're, you're particularly a fan of these days? Yeah, well, what, a good test for actual endothelial inflammatory activity is LPPLA2. And that one is actually, it, it's a good test. Now, it won't have near the predictive power of a calcium scan, but no blood test will. But LPPLA2 is a good sign of current endothelial inflammatory challenge. So that's a good one. Uh, the triglyceride over HDL is an old classic, a proxy for insulin resistance, of course, uh, or the total cholesterol over HDL. But trig over HDL is a great one. It's cheap and easy. Um, insulin measurement and glucose, two fasting measurements are simple, and you can get your HOMA, H-O-M-A, and people can Google HOMA calculator and you can stick in your insulin and glucose. If you're below 1.2, that's really good. If you're above 1.8, that ain't so good. So that's a measure of insulin resistance that's fairly easy. Um, a really super measure is if you drink 75 grams of glucose in a drink, and two hours later, you arrange to have a simple insulin single measurement, you get your two-hour insulin. And if that's below 30, fantastic. Above 40, pretty much you have a level of diabetes very likely. So that two-hour insulin is a little trickier. You know, if you're going to get your insulin draw at 11, even if you don't tell your doctor, because your doctor, he or she may not want to get involved in this weird stuff. So if you want to get it secretly, you just two hours before you get the blood draw, just drink the 75 grams glucose. And uh, the funny thing is, I often say to people, the doctor's going to get the insulin and go, oh my God. But then you can say to the doctor, oh, don't worry, it was a two-hour insulin. You go, huh? I drank the glucose, huh? You know, but anyway, it's you who needs to know more than your doctor. The, uh, you know, one of the sort of th messages coming out, particularly from the plant-based camp, is that uh, fat, particularly saturated fat in the blood, leads to of uh, intracellular lipids, and this is the cause of diabetes, uh, things like sphingolipids, uh, palmitic palmitate being uh, primary culprits in that, and then we see the accumulation of things like diacylglycerides and ceramides. Um, one of the things we had Ben Beckman on there talking about the fact that, you know, most of that is coming de novo from the liver. Can you comment on that sentiment or any concerns about the etiology of diabetes being from consumption of fat, or is it uh, doing with uh, overconsumption, perhaps cowards? Or yeah, okay, that one. Yeah, that's an old meme, and it's just it's just twisting science for their own agenda, obviously. Um, so basically, if you think of diabetes, or you know, high blood sugars, big problem, high blood insulin, and high uh, free fatty acids in your blood, and to simplify it. The problem with diabetic dysfunction, which does lead to all these, the sphingolipids, and it leads to all these problems, but they're overwhelmingly driven by diabetic physiology. That's the big thing. So if you stick to the big thing, what happens when you're diabetic? Well, it's not the sugar you eat that's causing so much of the problem. It's your liver pumping out sugar, right? With gluconeogenesis, and it's lost control. Also, the insulin that keeps your subcutaneous fat from lipolysis and keeps the fatty acids in your fat safely and not in your blood, well, insulin is required to keep the breaks on that uh, source of free fatty acids. But when you become diabetic, insulin loses its ability to keep your free fatty acids in your fat cells. So they begin to flow out. Now, when they flow out too much, they head to the liver. 
and they become a substrate to drive gluconeogenesis. <laughs> so the reason the diabetic drives blood sugar creation when they've already got a sugar problem is the liver can't help it because the liver is insulin resistant and also the free fatty acids because the insulin can't keep the fatty acids in your adipose cells. Well, that flood of free fatty acids going to the liver drives the process of gluconeogenesis. It provides the acyl substrates. It triggers other biochemical reactions to drive gluconeogenesis. So yes, the free fatty acids and fats in your blood are a problem, but it's not how, what, because of what, what they say. It's because it's all tied into diabetic dysfunction. So of course they don't discuss any of this. And just for a reference for what I just said there, I have a talk 2017 in Miami at a, a medical conference and I go through all these mechanisms and it's available on, on the web, uh, the Physicians for Ancestral Health 2017. But uh, a lot of the work came from Shulman Lab who have decoded what I just described, that the fats and the flow of fats to the liver is the problem. And that's all to do with hyperinsulinemia and adipose tissue insulin resistance. And it all goes back to bad diet, but not to fatten the diet. One last thing I will say is Professor Volokh answered this question. He got people with some metabolic issues and he gave half of them randomly a healthy, uh, high-ish carb diet. And he gave the other half a really low carb keto diet with masses of saturated fat, okay? What happened was that the people who had three times the saturated fat in the high fat diet ended up with significant drops in blood fat levels. So if you just think about that, he did the perfect experiment. In real life, I get metabolically challenged people who are the people we gotta be careful with. They're the cohort of interest, because if we take super healthy, healthy people, we're not gonna see a response. So he gets these people, and half of them he gives a super high sat fat keto diet, and the other half he gives a healthy high carb diet that they would recommend. And the people on the keto high fat diet, three or four times the saturated fat level, they had lower blood fats, right, of 16-1 um, fat. And, and that was it. He answered the question. And this has been done uh, actually multiple times. So, so the question's been answered. Uh, but those guys don't want to hear those answers, right? Because they want us all, I don't know, munching on oats or gruel or leaves or something. Well, that's okay. They can do that if they want. Just to clarify, were those studies, and I, I mean, do you know if they were isocaloric? I mean, one versus the other, was it, was there, you know, was it? Were they basically controlling for calories on those? From memory, Volokh, I think, has done ones with uh, no calorie control on the low-carb, high-fat uh, versus calorie controlled in the other arm. But that one, I'm pretty sure, was pretty much isocalorific um, because they were looking very specifically at the ratio of high-fat and they didn't want to confound with calorie. But I have the paper. I can send it afterwards. But I think that was an iso. They also did a fascinating experiment where they phased over a couple of months going higher and higher carb and then lower again. And they demonstrated the exact same phenomenon. Yeah, um, I want to, you know, because this thing, it's obviously controversial and there's people, but um, is it possible to play on fat to the point that you can, you know, is that is that doable? Uh, there's you know obviously there's people think it's 100% about hormones. There's other people think it's 100% about calories. I'm kind of in between, but yeah, I, I missed enough of that that I'm not sure. Is it possible to? Are, are, can you hear me okay now? I got you now. Yeah. So is it possible to overconsume fat to the point where you can run in? Overconsume fat to the point that you can self in trouble metabolically. Um, I think you can overconsume anything to that point. I mean, if you mix it with carbohydrate and sugars, you're going to hit the threshold in no time because that's the standard American diet. 
Um, if you're very low carb and you eat too much fat, my suspicion is if it's from real food sources, probably the worst you can do is increase your weight, but not necessarily to go towards tofi or metabolically sick weight increase. Um, my expectation, if we had the proper studies, is whole food, real food fats taken, no processing, to excess in a low carb environment, you will increase weight, but it will tend to be with the minimal amount of metabolic disease. But if you start taking free fats and oils and liquid, like there's a milkshake experiment where in fairness, they kept the carb pretty low, but they made them drink a liquid emulsion of I think 900 calories and they made them do it within a minute or two. So that enormous liquid fat load, they were able to register metabolic distress. Now you could say, where's the surprise in that? Now it was used as propaganda, of course. That's what they had to do to, to frame fat. So I'll go back again. If you eat whole foods, natural foods that are high fat, fat content with low carb, no processed food, no bad stuff, and you eat to excess, I would expect you'll increase body weight, but relatively will not increase metabolic disease level. Whereas if you had gone over calorific on the mixture of fat and carb, you know, you're going to explode. I mean, look at Dave Fellman. His insulin went from a fasting level of three. I think it was only within a week or two when he went on the standard American diet. It was up to 10 within a week. You know, and we have other human studies overfeeding with sad diets. And it's quite frankly shocking within days, their insulin resistance is going through the roof. You won't do that with real, real food, high fat foods, even if you eat a bit too much, I think. Hey, Ivor, I want to just insulin because some people are concerned because insulin is so quickly metabolized by the liver within like three minutes of production. Some people prefer uh, C peptide, C peptide. So C-peptide has a considerably longer half-life and the best measure of all is pro-insulin, but it's a hard test to get. So when you predict future heart attack and death, insulin predicts X, C-peptide predicts more strongly because it's more stronger reflection of underlying insulin resistance and pro-insulin reflects really strongly future disease because it's even better because it's the precursor to insulin and C-peptide. So pro-insulin is really good. But yeah, I'd say C-peptide is a really nice measure. They only use it currently for, um, I think, type 1 diabetes often to see how much insulin you're producing. But uh, it, it's a great measure to put alongside an insulin and give context to that. But, but I think insulin is still, as Dr. Ted Damon says, it's a really good measure, especially paired with glucose. And either on their own are not as good as the two together. And I think you, you got caught up in this controversy. So I myself have noticed glucose creeping up with time and myriad people around the world have. So if you're eating a sad diet, it's very important for your glucose to be say below 100. Because on a sad diet, a glucose that creeps, creeps up means insulin resistance. On a carnivore, a very low carb diet, many people produce more glucagon, and especially in the mornings, they naturally, their body boosts their glucose because they're in a low glucose environment. But they're not insulin resistant, hyperinsulinemic. So the higher glucose at 106 is perfectly fine. Wouldn't be in a sad eater, but in a person on this regime, it's fine. So the way to get the answer really quickly is put your glucose with your insulin in the HOMA, and that, that will give you the answer. I mean, However, you, do you uh, find that the, uh, the, the continuous glucose monitor would be a helpful, uh, helpful tool? Uh, I think they're fantastic. To be honest myself, I think for most people, eating to your meter with an ordinary cheap glucose monitor is enough. Just pricking your finger like once or twice after meals and verifying you don't go high on glucose. But um, it's a brave new world. And the CGM is going to give people dynamic live feedback all the time. So it's an, it's an incredibly powerful thing. And it will show people 
times they go high in glucose when they don't expect it and allow them to, to question why and, and improve their regime. So I think, I think it's fantastic, but I can't help but feeling that if the masses simply used an ordinary glucose meter after meals, you know, it would give you a lot of, of what CGMs are giving. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of the things I, I queried a company that makes them and, and asked why they are prescription only, or at least in the U S uh, and because is in China, they can make them for $10. <laughs> Fairly fairly high. So they, Manufacturers can you know, obviously make profit on that. So it's, uh, but you know, the, the, the technology is cheap and it's out there and we'll probably see it, you know, a phone app or something very quickly, uh, you know, coming along with that. And then, uh, as you said, insulin, if we can get the insulin version of the working on that, there probably is, that'll be another big. Well, actually my friend, Eric in, um, was it Germany or Austria? Anyway, I met him a couple of times. I also met him with Robert Lustig in London and uh, Gabor Doshi. Some of your listeners may, may know he's the Hungarian uh, biologist that I, I've worked with. He's working with the team there and they've just released, I think, their app and an initial release. You'll get a small white plastic disposable where you take a blood sample, put it into this uh, little container and use your mobile phone to scan with the camera and get readings for insulin, and I think possibly C-peptide as well, and triglyceride. I'm not 100% sure, but I know right now, Eric pinged me the other day, and they are in the act of releasing, and they are looking for early adopters to help support the program, because they spent a lot of money, and they're probably a bit tight now. So maybe we can put a link to those guys after this. Yeah, no, we, we certainly... We're all for supporting that type of stuff. Well, Ivor, it's almost an hour. Um, thank you very, very much. Wow. To you, it's a special treat. Um, I hope all is well and you stay safe and that uh, once we get through the back to business as usual, is saving the world from its own. Stay well, guys. Thanks a lot, Sean. And all right, bye, guys. Everyone. We're going to end this. You guys take care and I'll see everybody. Tomorrow. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you.